everyone and welcome back to another episode where we get to know more about real life relatable people in STEM. Now last week we had on some bird experts who came with the core facts in order to support their answers to the question, what is your favourite bird and why? Now this episode we are focusing on things much much smaller than birds, things that we cannot see with our naked eyes, microorganisms. This includes bacteria, viruses, fungi. And so with that being said, this episode is for us to get to know scientists within the field of microbiology. Now, I wanted to um, give us a bit of a flavour of the kind of research that has been done within the field of microbiology. And so I've simply asked these scientists to tell us about their research and I'm super excited for you to see their responses. Now before we begin I've put the links to the Twitter pages of each of the guests in this episode in the description box below and I'll also be displaying the Twitter handles while they're giving their responses. Um, Make sure you give them a follow in order to find out more about their research and also the cool things that they're doing in general and please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like any videos that you enjoy. Now let's begin. First up telling us about their research is Dr. Kat milligan Myrie. She's an assistant professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage and will be moving to the University of Connecticut in the fall. And I'll give a brief introduction on her journey in STEM. So she started out as a pre-med major, but fell in love with research when she worked in a research lab to boost her CV for medical school. Once she started her PhD, um, she had her eye on an academic position from the start, as she wanted to be able to mentor native students like herself. In terms of her previous research over the years, she studied toxin production in a bacteria for four years as an undergrad student and a lab technician, then switched to studying parasites as a graduate student. Since she had studied pathogenic microbes, microbes that have the potential to make us sick, um, she switched to microbes that keep us healthy for her postdoc position. And now I will let Kat tell you more about her current research. Uvla Lodak, hello. Uva na adaga na pakduk. I'm Dr. Kat Milligan Myrie. Inupak Miyaruna, I'm Inupak Kekikdagruk Miyaruna from Kotzebue, Alaska. I'm a microbiologist. That means that I study things that are so small that you need a microscope to be able to see them. These microbes are small, but they are mighty, and they are able to do things like help us, hosts who are thousands of times bigger than they are, develop from eggs to adults. I'm really interested in how these microbes have developed different relationships with their host. Now, nobody will let me grow humans in the research lab. So instead of studying humans, I study a little fish called three-spined stickleback. They're about this big, two to three inches big, and they are found in bodies of water all over the Northern Hemisphere. Each body of water, each lake, each stream, each ocean has a different pH and different salts and different chemicals, different light, different temperatures, and all of these affect the microbes that are in those bodies of water. So these fish have developed different relationships with their microbes. What I'm really interested in is how these different populations have different microbes, how they select for different microbes, and change those microbial communities. I'm also interested in how microbes from one community and one population may affect the fish in another community and another population. Finally, what I'm interested in is how these microbes help protect the host against pathogens. I do this a couple of different ways. One way is to make the fish germ-free. That means I take away all the microbes and then add back specific microbes to see how they help the fish develop. The other thing that I do is add back microbes and then determine whether that helps protect the host against pathogens or microbes that might cause disease. And the third way that I can study this is to disrupt those microbes with contaminants like crude oil or antibiotics, and then determine how that disruption of the microbiota affects fish from different population and their ability to develop and protect those hosts against disease. That's my research. Firstly, can we just take a moment to appreciate Kat's awesome introduction in Inupac? I think that's such a beautiful language. Secondly, micro-host interaction is really fascinating to learn about. Um, It's so easy for us to associate microbes with being harmful and causing disease, But as Kat has so nicely explained to us, they can actually be really important for our health and development. 
Now on to the second scientist who will tell us about their research. We have Dr. Efra Rivera Serrano. Now he was born and raised in Puerto Rico, raised by a single mother in a farm where they raised chickens, ducks and rabbits. Um, plus they would grow some crops such as beans and avocados, which was essentially how he paid partly for his education. He fell in love with nature and um, the forces that shape all things of life and so decided to study biology and chemistry in college. He completed his undergrad education in Puerto Rico and then moved to the USA mainland shortly after for grad school. He holds a master's degree in cell biology and a PhD in virology, both from North Carolina State University. He completed two postdocs, both in the USA and both focused on virus host interactions. Currently, he works as a research associate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And a random fact, Ephra has six rescue dogs that have kept him sane somewhat <laughs> along the way. Now, um, I'll hand over to Ephra, who will fill us in more about his research. So I study viruses, which unfortunately do not have the best reputation nowadays, given the current pandemic. Um, but I can assure you that viruses are really, really amazing. And uh, there's so much that they can teach us about biology and about life in general. If we just stop for a second and appreciate all the things that they have to do to their host in order for them to, to replicate. Um, so viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, which means that they can only survive inside of a target host cell. They have a very strong dependency for the cells that they infect um, to essentially accomplish everything that they have to accomplish in order for them to make more copies of themselves. So if you look at any textbook out there um, and you look for the, quote unquote the life cycle of a virus, regardless of the type of virus that we're talking about, there's a lot of commonalities. A virus has to find its target cell, it has to bind to it, it has to enter the cell, release the genetic material that will then be used as a template to create more copies of the virus that then have to be released from the cell and then they go on into infecting new cells. So there's a big dependency here for, for a cell. The virus, essentially every step of the life cycle of the virus depends on the cell. So I am interested in those very early stages uh, of infection. We all talk about um, antibody production and T cell immunity, for example, which take in, in, in the host, it takes um, a few days for that to happen. I am interested in those very, very early time points in, within hours of infection. Um, and so you can imagine that viruses have been roaming around this world for millions of years. You can imagine that cells have evolved ways to cope with them. Uh, makes no sense for ourselves to be okay when uh, being infected, right? So during the very first infection, from the moment that the virus enters the cell, the cell has evolved ways and it has ways to, to sense its pathways, um, to sense the, the things that viruses do to our cells. And so they have also evolved ways in, um, to, to prevent this to ha from happening, to, to block the viral infection very early on, way before antibody production, way before our adaptive immune system takes place. So this is that's where I study. I study those very early time points. And again, because every single step in the quote unquote life cycle of the virus happens inside of a cell, I use um, a lot of microscopy. Virus, viruses are extremely small. So I use advanced microscopy to sort of visualize this battle that occurs between the virus and the cell at very early stages uh, of infection and just learn um, ways that cells um, employ to prevent the viral uh, replication, but also ways that viruses have evolved to block those, uh, those responses from, from the cell in order for them to reproduce in, in, in their host. And so it's a fascinating area of, uh, of research. And um, if you want to know more, then I'm here to, uh, to answer any questions later on. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions about um, the fascinating life of, of cells when they are infected by a virus. See ya. That was fascinating. Whenever we think about viral infections, it's normally focused around physical symptoms, production of antibodies, um, the immunity that may arise at later stages of 
the viral infection. So it's really interesting to um, think of it from a different angle and at a different time point, an earlier time point as Ephra is doing. Um, and if you do want to see these microscopy images of viruses entering into host cells, then um, definitely check Ephra out on Twitter. Now on to the next scientist who will tell us about their research in the field of microbiology. We have Dr. Kashana Taylor, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of California, Davis. Now her journey in STEM started with a love of animals. She was obsessed with dolphins and knew that she wanted to work with and study them from when she was little. So she started out as a marine biology major, but didn't really realize that marine biology is much more than just studying marine animals. So through the course of her undergrad, she changed her major several times from marine biology to pre-veterinary and wildlife conservation with the intent to go to veterinary school and become a marine mammal veterinarian. In a quest to make her CV for school look good, she got into um, applied virology research and absolutely loved it. And so afterwards, she went on to do a master's in epidemiology and a PhD in biomedical science so that she could not only study zoonotic disease outbreaks, so and these are diseases that can be transmitted from animals to humans, but also why this happens. Now let's hand over to Kishana, who will tell us more about her research. And I am interested in viruses that are transmitted from animals to people. So these are also called zoonotic viruses. And specifically what I'm interested in is the processes, the characteristics, and the environments that allow for these viruses to make the jump. So how I answer these questions in my current research is that I examine what happens when multiple influenza virus serotypes or strains infect the same host cell. So this is called co-infection. Um, and so what happens during co-infection is that influenza viruses have segmented genomes as opposed to um, a single strand of RNA. They have eight segments of RNA. And so as the virus replicates inside the cell, they're producing multiple segments of RNA as well as the viral proteins that are required to make up a single cell, a single virus, or what we also call a virion. Um, and then basically enough, gen enough genetic material and enough proteins are made so that you can make multiple virions. Um, and so when more than one influenza virus is in the same cell, um, both viruses, genome segments, and proteins are being replicated, and then they're packaged into new virions. And so what's really cool is that because um, the genome is segmented, you can sometimes get mixing of segments into the different virions, and these can create new viruses, and this is called reassortment. So reassortment is what I study in my lab. And so reassortment is responsible for pandemic strains of influenza virus, like the 2009 swine flu, where you had a reassortment event between um, a swine flu, an avian flu, and a human flu. Um, and so currently I research avian influenza viruses to get a better understanding of how, of, how often reassortment occurs um, and which influenza, avian influenza strains reassort with one another um, and whether or not there are any patterns that we can discern from that. Um, and so with that, we can then take this information and hopefully better predict when and if a pandemic flu virus is going to arise. Then the next question is, so how do we do that? Um, and so most of my work is done in a lab. It's all experimental. Um, and so I will take um, multiple influenza viruses and we will infect them into something called cell culture. So um, we have basically cells from a duck, um, and a duck embryo, and we um, let them grow on inside of a petri dish or inside of what we call like a well plate. And then um, we let them grow until they're kind of all squished together in something called a monolayer. And then we will infect these cells with multiple viruses, the multiple avian influenza viruses. Um, and then we will select for a couple of viruses and then we sequence them. And so from there we can see, right, like we know the sequences of the original viruses that we have. And then we, then we get the sequences for the, what we call progeny viruses. Um, and then we can see, how many of those viruses are reassortants? So how many of those are viruses with swapped or switched or mixed segments? And how many of those just look like the regular um, avian influenza viruses that we started out with? And from there, we can, can get an idea of, in general, over one cycle of replication, how many viruses created, 
um, from the parent viruses, how many of those progeny viruses are actually reassortants, and that can kind of give us an idea of, of how often this um, phenomenon is occurring. Wow. Kashana's research is super fascinating, but also really important, especially at a time like this where we are currently in a pandemic. Many people are often confused by how um, viruses can jump from an animal to human or how new viruses can be created. And I think an explanation like Kashana's, where she was explaining about different viral gene segments, mixing and reassorting, that can really help in educating the masses. And I'm really hoping that if scientists like Kashana are able to predict if a pandemic is likely to occur, that this will help us as a society, hopefully better prepare for and respond to future outbreaks. Now on to our last scientist who will tell us about their research in microbiology. We have Yasha Dugal. She is a graduate research assistant currently in a chemistry program at Pennsylvania State University. Before she studied signaling in bacteria, she was a physical chemist at Case Western Reserve University. At this time, she was synthesizing and studying gold nanoparticles and testing to see if we could use them as vehicles to deliver medicine as a cancer therapy. Over time, she became more interested in the biological aspects of the project and so decided that she wanted to pursue chemical biology in graduate school. And so that's exactly what she's currently doing. Her PhD has been an interesting journey as she initially joined the chemistry program at Emory University and then moved with the lab to Penn State at the end of her second year. So if you have any questions about um, switching programs or moving universities during grad school, then Yasha is the person to get in contact with. Now let's hear more about her research. Our world is full of microbes from deep sea vents to animals to plants on land, and even us as humans, we all rely on bacteria to help us process and digest food into more usable nutrients. But despite all the benefits, bacteria also wreak havoc in the form of diseases like meningitis or food poisoning and more serious illnesses like uh, tuberculosis and pneumonia. And our main arsenal against bacterial diseases is antibiotics. But bacteria, they are insanely clever. And some strains of bacteria have evolved over time to become resistant to a wide range of antibiotics. And so as a chemist, I'm interested in studying how we can manipulate the way that bacteria talk as an alternative to more traditional antibiotic therapies. And so bacteria, unlike you and I, they don't talk through words. They're not capable of sending each other texts. Instead, what they do is they use small molecules that allow them to sense each other and their environment. And in particular, I study a set of these small molecules that are known as cyclic nucleotides. Cyclic nucleotides are produced in the cell through um, the breakdown of small segments of RNA. And they're implicated in stress response, but we don't know the full extent of their roles in the cell. And so what I do is I use a wide range of biochemical tools to change the levels of cyclic nucleotides in the cell. And then I stress the bacteria in different ways. So like antibiotic stress or metal stress and see how the bacteria responds. And what I've found so far is in E. coli, when I reduce the level of cyclic nucleotides, I actually see that the cells are more sensitive to antibiotics. And what I want to do next is study a wide range of bacteria from different backgrounds and see how the cyclic nucleotides are affecting their stress response. Because if we see the same trends that we see in E. coli, that means we can actually use the innate cellular machinery in the cells as a way to treat uh, diseases that are currently difficult to treat because the bacteria are resistant to antibiotics. 
One of the things that I love most about science is innovation and Yasha's research project demonstrates just that. Um, you know, for many years we've heard about antibiotic resistant bacteria and so it's so interesting that we could potentially use bacteria's own cellular machinery in order to lower their resistance to antibiotics. And an important thing to note from Yasha's background is that if you want to work in the field of microbiology, you do not necessarily have to have a background in biology or microbiology. As Yasha has clearly shown, her expertise in chemistry has been incredibly useful in studying bacterial signaling. And so that concludes this episode where I have asked scientists within the field of microbiology to tell us about their research on the small stuff. I really hope you've enjoyed this as much as I did. And if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with these wonderful scientists. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, please remember to subscribe to this channel for more content and also like any videos that you have enjoyed. And I will see you very soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.